Hallelujah. This morning, I'm not talking about pruning. I'm just encouraging you that God, God's expectation from his children, Christians, is high. It's very high. I know that you are doing a lot. I know. But God expects more. And that is why we're going through what we are going through, what we have been discussing, what we've been looking at. Because, yes, indeed, you are born of the Spirit. Yes, indeed, you have shown signs that you're walking in the Spirit. But not only does He want you to walk in the Spirit, but He wants you to live in the Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Galatians 5. 25. Can you give me uh, King James? If we live in the Spirit... Let us also. Hello. If you live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. They are not the same. If they are, they are the same, we won't see this in the Bible. Living in the Spirit, living according to the Spirit, is not the same as walking in the Spirit. So Paul says that if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. We have to, you know, we have something we say, uh, you have to walk the talk. You can't say you are somebody, but you don't walk that light, or you don't just really let people see what you're made of. So, this morning, I want us to look at Romans chapter 8, 5 to 9. Last week, I tried to look at it. I mean, we touched a little bit on that, but we're going to spend a little bit more time on that. Those who live according to the flesh... Have your mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Now, mind is coming into the picture. This is a mind game. Hallelujah. Some years ago, I heard the Lord tell me in my spirit that you are your soul. You are your soul. Hallelujah. You see, this body counts for nothing. You are not your body. Amen. You are not your body. It counts for nothing. Amen. Amen. You are your soul. Because when you stand before God, whether you are white or black or green or yellow, doesn't count. Amen. What counts? Because, in fact, when we stand before him, he's not going to see bodies. Because we are going to be, he, he, we're going to be just one kind of body because he's going to give us a new body. So this one doesn't count. So it's your soul that counts. Amen. Amen. Body, soul, spirit. But you know that soul can also be really looked at as your mind. Amen. Amen. So, the Bible is saying that those who live according to the flesh 
which is like the body, the physical, have your mind set on what the flesh desire, what the body desire. And not only the physical body, but what the fist, I mean like thi- things we see, things we really can touch, those are the things that that person really is focused on. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mindset on what the Spirit desires. And the, the desire of the Spirit is different, it's on souls. Hallelujah. It's on how you can make it to heaven, how you can walk and live in eternity with Jesus. That's what he's focused on. That's why the Colossians says that set your hearts and your minds on things above, not on earthly things, not on physical things. Amen. Amen. It's important for us to understand what the Lord expects from us. I set the standards are really high. We have come to a place in Christianity or a moment or times where everything about Christians today is about the here and now. I know sometimes we come to church with our needs expecting that we will hear something that will comfort us in the present time. Hallelujah. But you see, the mistake we make is here, what we're thinking about. Because when, when you hear the word of God, it's to prepare you for eternity. But you can't just vanish into eternity today. You're going to live here before you go. And everything you hear is to help you really walk this life so you end up in eternity with Christ. So even though he's talking about life to come, you need to understand that you need to live a life here before you get there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Paul made justice to that in 1 Corinthians 15. I'm not going to read that. But what basically he was saying was, if we as Christians are just focused on the here and the now, then we are of all people most to be pitied. Because it's not about here and the now. So, hello, a Christian that's foco- that focuses on what he can eat, what he can drink, and how he can dress, and the car he can drive. And, and if that's what occupies your mind, you are, of all people, most to be pitied, according to the word of the Lord. Because most of the time, we are thinking about, hey, but if I don't do this, how will I eat? If I don't do this, how would I get a new car? How can I finish building my house? How can I marry and take care of my kids? How can I do this? How can I? We are too much focused on the now. And we are not thinking about eternal life. And that makes you know who you are. Because the people of the Spirit walk according to the Spirit. Hallelujah. And they live their lives according to the Spirit. How do you live your life? What are you focused on? What do you occupy your mind with? Hallelujah. The flesh desires, but the Spirit also desires. So the Bible is saying that we ought to really come to a certain kind of understanding in our walk with the Lord such that we will be able to focus on what the Spirit desires. Hallelujah.
<laughs> Are we here? The man governed by the flesh, the mind controlled by the flesh, is death. But the mind governed or controlled by the spirit is life and peace. Are we here? What controls your mind? Is your mind being controlled by the flesh or is your mind being controlled by the spirit? And if you see a person, a Christian, it's very easy to tell what is controlling his mind. You see, let me ask you a question. When you are all by yourself and there's no one there, And you are all by yourself, and you are sitting by yourself, and you are thinking, what do you think about? In those moments, what do you think about? Extremely important. Because that will let you know who you are. Whether you are a spiritual person or a person of the flesh. I have a, I mean, this is an interesting example, so I'll share. I mean, we, we had it here on Thursday. I had a little, uh, uh, I mean, an interesting conversation with one of us during the uh, Bible study. You remember on Thursday? Do you remember that? Yeah. And the conversation was, I'm doing something. And that's what I love to do. And that's what will give me amen. But as we discussed and as we progressed, we realized that that's not in accordance with the Spirit. But then he says, But that's what I want to do. I judge no one. But if the Spirit of God makes you understand that something is not right, and that's what you still desire to do, who are you? And most of the times when we sit down all by ourselves and we reflect and we think about life, Many times we're not thinking about where we're going to spend eternity. Many times we're thinking about where I'm going to get my next meal. How am I going to pay my kids' school fees? How am I going to get a nice guy to marry or a nice woman to marry? How is my business going to flourish? How am I going to pass my exam? And that is why, even for students, during exam week, they don't read the Bible because they say they are busy learning. They can sit down and read a book for hours on end, but they will not sit down for 30 minutes to read the Bible because that will affect their studies. Who are you? What about if after the exam Jesus comes? Oh, are you saying we don't have to really study? No, I'm not saying don't study. But I'm, st- I'm saying that what does your spirit desire? I 
I know it's challenging. I know this is not what we want to hear. But this is from the Bible. If God doesn't want us to hear, he will write it for us. Amen. First Timothy. Chapter 5, verse 6. But the widow who lives for pleasure is even while. And I'm not talking about a widow, I'm talking about you. So put your name there. Or right, let's put man. But the man who lives for pleasure is dead while he's still. You are alive, but you are dead. Because many of us live for pleasure. Many of us will live for pleasure. And because of that, we don't even think about eternal life. Because we are being controlled by the flesh. And the flesh wants to live. Having great pleasure. Pleasures of the world. Hallelujah. First John 2.16 For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from... Now, watch this. What really turns you on? What really makes you excited? Is it the Word of God? Or the lust of the flesh? or lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. That shows who you are. It tells you who you are. If you are are holding the Bible, or if you you have um, a preaching to watch, and you have a movie to watch, what moves you? What really would you want? Which one, I mean, which one attracts you the most. Bible and a novel, which one attracts you the most? About seven steps to make money. Which one attracts you most? Amen. You see, the, the, the truth is that as a, as a person who calls yourself a Christian, What really are you focused on? Because the flesh has its desires and the spirit has its desires. Which one are you following? How are you living your life? Are you living your life according to the flesh or according to the spirit? According to the flesh, I mean the desires of the flesh or the desires of the spirit. What does does the, the, the flesh desire? What does the flesh desire? The flesh desires pleasures of the world. The flesh desires wealth, which Jesus called the deceitfulness of wealth. The flesh cares about this world and the things that we can make and the things we can get. Hallelujah. Those are the things that the flesh is thinking about. The flesh is not thinking about souls. The flesh is thinking, you know, let me, one of the the most important things of the spirit 
is souls. Why am I saying that? Because God says that he does not want or he does not desire or he does not take pleasure in the, in the death of a sinner. So, the spirit that lives in us is the spirit of God. And if that is what God's desire, God, God desire, God's desire, or God's, I mean, um, what, what he, he wants is that everyone should make it to heaven. That should be what you desire as well. That should be what you focus on. When you are all by yourself, are you strategizing how you can win souls for the Lord? Hallelujah. You see, what is inside of you really determines what you follow. Who is governing your life? Who is ruling your life? What did we read? The life that is governed by the flesh desires what is okay for the flesh. Hallelujah. And the life that is governed or the mind that is governed by the spirit is life and peace. So, the, let me tell you something. Everyone sitting here has a desire. But which side is your desire skewed towards? Are you skewed towards flesh or the spirit? Hello. Let me tell you this. Everyone sitting here knows who they are. You know. You can pretend. You can lie about it. You can do whatever you want to do. But you know. You know. As you sit here, what are your desires? That determines who you are. That tells me who you are. But I don't need to know. You have to know and you have to tell yourself and then tell yourself whether you are doing right or wrong. And make a decision this morning. We have decisions to make every day. Every single day of our lives, we have decisions to make. Your mind. Hallelujah. I said, how do you think and what do you think about? And that's why Solomon said in Proverbs, as a man Proverbs 23, 7. It's important you understand. I want a King James. It's important you understand these things. Extremely important. Hmm. Beloved, I pray that we will sit up again. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. The, listen, the mind that is focused on the flesh, that is set on the flesh, thinks about food, what they will eat every day. Eating, food, drinking, parties. The way we prepare for parties, we don't prepare like that for church. True or false? Mm -hmm. 
You see, I'm just trying. You know, what I'm doing this morning is that I'm giving you the opportunity to really think and ask yourself whether you're a spiritual man or you're a fleshy man. Are you ruled by the flesh? Are you governed by the flesh? Or you are governed by the spirit? You would have to make that, I mean, tell yourself, yeah, make that analysis and tell yourself where you belong. I want you to think. Because it's a mind thing. If you don't really prepare, beloved, there's coming a time it will be too late for you. It may be too late. And I don't want anyone to be caught unawares. Go to the next verse. You need to think about this. The mind governed by the flesh is what? Do do you know what is hostile? Enmity. And enmity is different from enemy. Enemy and enmity are not the same. Enmity is hostility, hostile. So King James says enmity, but NIV says hostile. It's the same. You know, when someone is your enemy, you can reconcile. But when you are hostile to someone, and Bible is saying, you see, you haven't taught about these things. You haven't. Most of us haven't taught about it. We think we are okay. You see, And I have a new standard in my life. And it's based on just a very simple scripture that we all read all the time but do not pay attention. It's Matthew 7, 21 to 23. You see, you may be hostile to God but you don't even know. But when you stand before him, when you are making that argument that I was in church, I could do this, I could do that, I could do this, I could preach, I could, I mean, dance, play the drums, play the organ, say whatever you want, I could, I could get, now you see, I don't even want to go there. I spoke to someone. I spoke to someone. A young guy, only last week. He came here, actually. He came to see me here. Uh, He's not a church member. He came for something else. And I was in church, so when he called, I was here. I said, come. So they came. They were two. And when we were chatting, he was telling me stories. And he was mentioning names. And he was talking about, you see... For, for this one, he has an anointing for crowd. Crowd. He has an anointing for crowd. I said, look, and for what crowd? Oh, yeah, when, when, wherever he goes, he gathers people. People come. I said, that's fine. But who are those people? Who are they going to end up? Amen. Who had more anointing for crowd than Jesus? They could follow him and he could feed 5,000 men minus women and children. So tell me what the number is. And tell me the world population at that time. And tell me what percentage of the population he was really drawing to himself. Yet when he left, he was left with 120. Crowd. 
could be okay. But be careful. When he, when he said that, I said, look, what is important is discipleship. How you can set people down and disciple them. Even that is not easy. Hallelujah. <laughs> so one thing we need to really begin to focus on, and I, I said, look, I don't begrudge you. I don't, I don't have any problem with anyone who has an anointing for crowd, but I wish I will have an anointing for souls that will make it to heaven. Not just for crowd. Hello? You see, Someone will say, yeah, but why are you always, and I've heard this many times, why are you always preaching about heaven and hell and making people, I, I said people should be afraid. I said, I don't want anybody to have, be afraid. But if you are not afraid of hell, then there's something wrong with you. If you are excited about hell and not afraid of hell, <laughs> then there's a question mark. Listen. Yeah, but the way you talk, it looks like you're judging the people. The word of God, can you put it there? Hebrews 4.12. What does this say? It's what? Sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to soul and spirit. I told you earlier on that soul and spirit are different. Yeah. Joints and marrow, it goes inside your bones. It judges. So, the moment you are listening and something is going, it's no meal. It's the word of God. The word of God is judging your what? The thoughts and the attitudes of your heart. Does my heart think? Of course, yes. Hallelujah. So I'm not judging no one. I'm preaching the word. If the word chooses to judge you, then respond. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, I just want us to really understand the standard God has set is high. And God disciplines the one he loves. And God says that And go like this, go like this. He's bearing fruit. Look at him, bearing fruit everywhere. Trousers, shirt, bearing fruit. And then God comes. Because God wants this one, not only to have just one branch, because this is producing, okay, that's fine. But he wants more branches here. So this one will be cut and it will begin to spread. But he's already bearing fruit. Why would you do that to him? How can the clay ask the porter? What you, what you <laughs> no, I don't want this. I don't want to. I, no, no, no. Don't prune me. What I'm bearing is enough. Who decides what to bear? <laughs> you are comfortable here. Is, did you hear that? I'm, I'm comfortable bearing only one branch. No, 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 no. You are comfortable, but who made you? Do you know what it cost me for, for you to be bearing the, on this one branch? I want more branches. I want more branches. And therefore, you are doing well, but... Oh, so you can give more. So you can bear more fruit. And not only this one. And when I cut this, it's going to hurt. It's painful. And it takes time to heal. And during the healing process, you're going through pain. But God, I think I'm doing well. I've been preaching. I've been doing good. 
I've been serving you. Yeah, I want, to serve, I want you to serve me more. I want you to serve me more. Yeah, you've been, you've been serving. I, I, I don't dispute that. But if I want more from you, then I have to prune you. But why would you do it in a way that makes me feel pain? But I'm God. And I know how best to get you, get your attention. You see, when people don't feel pain, their prayer life changes. Exactly. So, if you, for example, he said he's comfortable. So, he has this hand producing. He's comfortable. He's complacent. He doesn't want to do any more. For God to, so in the past, before he grew this branch, it was here. Before he grew this branch, he was praying like never before. He was doing evangelism. He was, and then he grew this branch. And more was coming. But then he became complacent. But God, God was not okay with us. God wants him to do more. The only way he can get his attention to pray more is when he hurts him. So when he prunes him, he begins to feel the pain. And begins to do more. Because he's going to pray more for God to heal him. He's not going to be complacent now. He's going to pay attention. He's going to ask himself, why is God doing this to me? You know, when, when you begin to ask God, God, Lord, why are you doing this to me? God is excited because he's speaking to his son. Because his son has not spoken to him in a while. He's bearing. That's, that's okay. But God wants you to bear more. And you need to keep pressing to bear more. So Paul said that I have a thorn in my flesh. He said, I have a thorn in my flesh. Why would God put a thorn in the flesh of Paul? Why would God do that? He said, my grace is sufficient for you. You see, when he is going through that, he goes to God. You see, sometimes we are made strong in our weakness. We are made strong in our weakness. When we feel, when he's going through that pain of the, of the cut. Because pruning means God is going to cut some branches off. So that, not because he wants to kill, but he wants them to produce, he wants the tree to produce more. Exactly. <laughs> he wants you to produce more. Mommy was this morning sharing with some people. He said, look, in my, I, I'm a farmer. In my own farm at this time, I'm doing pruning. We've really brought down the big trees because they were, you see, and mommy didn't understand. He said, but look at the, the trees. They have a lot of cocoa. Why are you doing this? When they, they fell the trees, they fell, fall on the cocoa and they are, you know, branches are broken and you go and pots, immature pots are lying there. I said, mommy, the important thing you need to understand is that last season, these trees produced. But these trees on the, on the farm created a kind of uh, environment in the farm. And because of that, there was very, aeration was very poor. There was high humidity. And when there, it was raining, we got a very high level of black pot diseases. Now, what you see now, if we don't remove these trees, we're going to see the same thing this year. But if we remove these trees, these ones will be hurt in the meantime. But as they recover and they even produce more, these trees will not be there to create that kind of uh, situation which will bring more diseases. And that's how God really deals with us. If you go to the farm now, you will see that, in fact, you will think that I'm crazy. The farmers in the area think I'm crazy. They don't understand why we see all these spots on the trees and this guy is doing this massive damage to the trees. I said, you do not understand. If you understand what I'm doing, you will appreciate it. Wait until August. Come and see. Hallelujah. God is saying to you, wait 
until your soil heals. And you begin to develop more branches and you begin to produce more. You will be excited to see the results and God will be super excited to see you producing more. Hallelujah. Amen. His expectation, you can sit down. His expectation for what he wants us to do is great. We, we do not pay attention to things. But God is consistently calling us to really make decisions to save him. He wants us to really begin to think about heaven. And anyone who is heavenly minded is a soul winner. Because he sees people and he sees that these people will go to hell and something springs up in him or her and he becomes passionate for these souls. He is not concerned about what he will eat because he is a spiritual person and anyone who lives according to the spirit knows the deeds of the spirit, knows the ways of the spirit. He knows the ways of God and he knows that God will provide. The spiritual man is not thinking about what he will eat today. He's thinking about what God wants him to do today. Because God has promised him that if you seek me first and my righteousness, all these things shall be added unto thee. So the spiritual man is seeking to please the Lord. That's what a spiritual man does. But the man of the flesh says that, what about if I go, what will I eat? The spiritual man is not thinking about what they will eat, but what will be pleasing to God. Hallelujah. So the spiritual man is able to fast. But the man of the flesh is like a gluten. Always, always drinking, always eating. He has, he wants a three-course meal. He wants to eat morning, afternoon, and evening. And in the evening, when he sits down, he wants entree. He wants the main course, and he wants a dessert. He has time to sit down and take his time and eat. The man of the flesh is really seeking to please the flesh, to make the body... The body should flourish, preparing for some maggots. <laughs> Hallelujah. We prepare. No, that's the reality. I'm not saying don't eat, but I'm saying that God knows what is good for you. The spiritual man is focused on what God is thinking. Because the Spirit of God lives in him. And the Spirit of God is the one who directs him. Bible says that the man of the Spirit has the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. You see, when Paul was speaking about, but you have the mind of Christ, he's talking about the spiritual man. He's not talking about the man of the flesh. He's talking about a spiritual person. Somebody whose desire is to really please the spirit. Beloved, it is not only where you are going. It is who you really are and how you live. Do you live for the flesh or you live for the spirit? And it's easy to know who you are living for. Very easy. I said very easy because what is your mindset on? What is your mindset on? 
is your mind set on things above? On things that the spirit desire? Or on things that the flesh desire? Some of us will battle and do everything to get a new dress. Some of us will beg to get an invitation not to a godly meeting but to someone's birthday party because they just want to be there. Hallelujah. They want to be there for people to know that they were there. And we have become so much in the flesh to such an extent that we want to get there and post it on social media to see you. And it breaks my heart. And I want you to hear me well because don't hear what I didn't say. Hear what I said. It breaks my heart when people, Christians, are willing and ready to just take a picture with an unbeliever who is somebody in society and post it that I was there. I was there. I was there. You were where? Are you not ashamed of yourself that you were also at that party? And sometimes we are dancing to some awkward music and then we will post it. Who are you? Who are you? You are focused. Your mind is set on earthly things. It's not set on heavenly things. When was the last time you won a soul and you really took a picture with a soul that did not even have shoes to wear? And posted on your status the latest soul in heaven. When was the last time you did that? You are ashamed even to take a picture with that person. You are ashamed. A man of the spirit is not ashamed to let the world know he belongs to. Jesus said, if you are ashamed of me and my word, I will be ashamed of you. You want the world to know that you know that man. But you don't want the world to know that you know this man. This man in church, because this man in church is wearing the same shirt all the time. So even in church, you are looking and selecting who your friend should be. It's about that guy because he drives this car. Because he's this man. Because he's this woman. Because he's so. And because he's so. That's a mind of the flesh focused on the status of people who they are in society, not who they are in the Lord. We have become too earthly. We have become too worldly. And we don't even realize it. When was the last time you wanted to hear a prophecy that tells you that go to the village to preach? When was the last time you wanted that? When was the last time 
You prayed, God, I want to hear your voice concerning my ways with you and what I should do and how I should walk before you. When was the last time? Every meeting you went, you want the pastor or the prophet to tell you how many cars you are going to buy when your promotion is coming. And we've got prophets like that. Bible says that in the end time, We'll gather around ourselves people who will tell us what our itching ears want to hear. We are in a season where we are so much into the flesh that I'm not saying every prophet, but majority of the prophets are in the flesh. And you know what God says about them? He says, I've not told them anything. I've not even sent them. Why has God be suddenly become so interested in how many cars you have? How? How? Tell me. Listen, tell me. Show me in the Bible. What happened to God? That suddenly, all that God is interested in is for you to be a millionaire. Not to go to heaven. Why? What's going on? What's going on? When did we become so worldly that every prophecy we want to hear and every prophecy we are hearing is about money, 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 money. When was the last time you saw a seed that will make you really very, 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 very anointed? Every seed we sow is to have more money. Hello. Can I close? Who are you? A spiritual man? Or a man of the flesh? When God tells you that go to the church and lie in front of the altar and call on me and I will come and I will empower you so that you go to the streets of East Ligon and preach to all the prostitutes that are on the streets. What will you do? Is that your desire? If God says that to you, will you come? What about if he says, go to that altar, lay down in my presence, and by the time you wake up from the altar, and you go downstairs, there's a BMW parked there. And that man is going to propose to you. What will you do? What will you do? <laughs> but when the word came, you were at work. Will you stop work and come? Sharp. But what about if God, when God said that come, you were at work and he said, come and I will anoint you to preach to all the prostitutes. What will you tell God? God, I'm at work. I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. The evangelism team is there. It's their work. They are supposed to do that. No, when did we become, you see, and we, are, we say we are in church and we are Christians and we are going to heaven, but you are filled with fleshly desires. Who are you? I'm not saying you are going to hell, 
Because there's an opportunity for you to change today. I'm telling you what the Bible says. The Bible defines who you are. And he's telling you, if you don't believe it, go sit down and read the Bible yourself and find out for yourself what the Bible is saying about your own life. It's not because you said, you, somebody called you and you stood there and you said, I give my life to the Lord. Uh, I, I, I take the Lord as my Lord. Uh, I take Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And then that's, that's all. You are going to heaven. No. Because the Bible says that if indeed that transition really did happen, the Spirit of God lives in you. And he's the one going to direct your affairs. That old man will still be around. Will be fighting, as we saw in Galatians 5.16. There will be a battle that is going on. But you would have to really allow the Spirit of God to lead the way. This morning, who are you? Are you a man or a woman of the flesh? Or you are a man or woman of the Spirit? How are you living your life? Are you living according to the Spirit? Or you are living according to what your flesh demands? Beloved in the Lord, this morning, I believe that God is speaking to you. And I believe that it's time for many of us to make a decision. Stand up on your feet.